Presented by Caltech. So good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Andrew Howard, a professor of astronomy here at Caltech. Andrew is a planet hunter and a planet finder, one of the best. And he works in a field that is one of the most exciting fields in all of science because of the explosion of discoveries in the past decade. Andrew was born and raised in Minnesota. He got his undergraduate degree at MIT and his PhD at Harvard, where he was looking at ways to detect short laser pulses that might come from extraterrestrial civilizations. A somewhat quixotic quest, perhaps, but involving some very important technical and observational innovation. In 2007, he had the good sense to switch to exoplanets, a rapidly expanding field at that time. He became a postdoc at Berkeley, which was a hotbed uh, in the study of exoplanets. And in that period and subsequently, including his time at the University of Hawaii, uh, he developed a program that became one of the leading efforts in the characterization of planets, and in particular planets that might be like the Earth. Now, it's a little bit of a debate about exactly what it means to be Earth-like, but you will hear about that tonight. Because of that work, he received a prize from the National Academy of Sciences. He doesn't just look for Earth-like planets. In fact, those are not the most common kind. Uh, there are lots of objects called super-Earths and sub-Neptunes, somewhat unfortunate titles for objects that are nothing like what we see in our solar system. But uh, he is leading in this effort to characterize planets elsewhere in the universe. Uh, let's welcome Andrew to tell us about his work. Thank you, it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. I wanna start off tonight with a tribute to a scientific hero of mine. Uh, perhaps as it was for some of you, uh, Stephen Hawking played a role in my early scientific development. Um, I read his books voraciously. I also read Sagan and Feynman. Um, and the combination of reading all three of them flipped on a switch in my head, and it's a switch that hasn't gone off. It's been going for, for 20 some years. So I wanna share a couple stories of a run-in that I had uh, with Stephen Hawking. Um, this story starts in 1999 or 2000, I can't remember exactly, and I was a graduate student at Harvard. Um, I was in my early years there. And Stephen was coming for one of his extended visits to work with some of the physicists there and also to, to give a big public lecture, somewhat like this. I, I dare say that Stephen would manage to fill the house, though. Um, and so an unfortunate thing happened, and a, a note was posted on the laboratory door in the, the lab where I was working. See, the, the charging circuitry on Stephen's batteries on his wheelchair were not working, and the same batteries ran the voice synthesizer, and so there was a chance that he wouldn't be able to give his big talk that night. So the theoretical physicist came down to, to visit the experimental physicists, and they gave us this note, and we, Paul Horowitz, my advisor, he and I uh, went upstairs to the fourth floor with a screwdriver and a voltmeter in our back pockets, mostly for effect, and we, we uh, set about to try to fix Stephen's uh, wheelchair. And what was remarkable is that the whole time, he was just cracking jokes. Um, the guy had an incredible sense of humor. He also has a, an incredible economy with words. Uh, for a person that's confined to a wheelchair and can only compose uh, messages in his voice synthesizer with small motions from his hand, he had to be really good 
uh, with short uh, repartee, and he was. So it turns out we were able to fix his wheelchair, and he successfully gave his talk uh, that night to about 3,000 people, uh, and we felt, uh, we felt proud to have helped him. The second part of the story is the, happened later that night, which was in the Q&A part of his speech. And so after he gave his, his talk, which had been pre-recorded on his voice recorder, and he could basically just hit go, um, this young graduate student from Cambridge University came out onto stage and answered all of the questions for Stephen. The reason, of course, is that he could compose short responses, but not longer-winded replies that were needed for a Q&A. And what really struck me about this was that um, this particular graduate student was one of the most arrogant people I've ever met. And I, at, in Harvard Physics Department, there's a pretty high bar for that. <laughs> and, and, and he was also a really good-looking guy. And what one of the people next to me said is that, you know, actually all of the fellows that, go, that follow Stephen around and have this special title have these characteristics because that's how Stephen wants people to see him. He wanted to be seen as young and handsome and arrogant and brilliant. And so he, <laughs> he, he trotted these people out. Anyway, um, see, he was a complicated guy with human desires and failings. And he's also, for me, he exhibits uh, and demonstrates the full range of human potential. So I'm going to miss him, and I'm, I'm sad that he's gone. So the topic of my talk tonight is extrasolar planets. And I want to start off by making sure that we're all on the same footing. So tonight I'm going to be talking about extrasolar planets, which are planets that orbit stars other than the sun. Sometimes I'm going to use the phrase exoplanets, this uh, an abbreviation. And sometimes I'll lapse and simply just call them planets. And this is a term which encompasses the bodies in our solar system uh, as well, of course. So I'd like to start the, the formal part of my talk by asking the, you, the audience, a question. I'd like to, to ask, what makes a planet Earth-like? If we were to discover some other planet and I told you its characteristics, what characteristics would you say make it uh, Earth-like, and that you would respond, that's a twin of the Earth. So I'll give you a moment to think. So I've asked this question in many venues and with, with many people. And some of the answers that I get, I actually heard murmurs of in the audience. I think one of the most obvious ones is water. Water is. Um, an elixir for life on, on the Earth. It's hard to imagine life as we know it without water. We are bathed in water. Our cells are mostly water. Um, it's, it's essential for life on Earth. Maybe it's essential for life on other planets. Another common answer, which I agree with, is the atmosphere of the Earth is important because it buffers our, uh, the surface of the Earth against wild temperature swings, especially the day-night cycle. The atmosphere also provides the oxygen that we breathe and which enables metabolism. Some slightly more complicated uh, and uh, more detailed answers include things like bacteria and archaea, simple life. I think if we found another planet where we can unambiguously say that there were single cell organisms, we would say that is a cousin of Earth. Going down the line, complex life is a much is a, a longer shot. This was part of my earlier career, as Dave said, was spent looking for signals from complex life. We haven't found any yet. But I think they would be an unmistakable sign of an Earth-like planet. But what about the finer things in life? What, what would be an automatic, guaranteed recognition as an Earth-like planet? I guess for me, if, I, if we found a planet that had a really good cup of Kona coffee or <laughs> Sasabune sushi, I would, that would be perfect. That's top of the galaxy. So un unfortunately, some of these qualities are really difficult to measure with our current uh, telescopes. What we are able to measure are qualities of a planet like the size of a planet, its radius. We're able to measure the masses of the planet, that is, how many atoms are comprised up, comprise that celestial body. Combining size and mass, we can estimate the bulk density of a planet. And we know that planets that have high bulk densities are made of dense materials, that they have compositions that are consistent with dense materials like rocks and iron. 
Similarly, planets which have low densities must have uh, thick gaseous envelopes that, uh, that lower their overall bulk density. So for searching for Earth-like planets, we have to make a list of what it is that we can actually detect. And I'll, I'll assert that in the near term, what we're able to detect are the qualities on the left in red. And we're going to have to content ourselves with those and maybe aspire to some of the qualities on the right in the very longer term. OK, so that's, that's what we call an Earth-like planet. Let's talk now about how we actually discover planets and measure their characteristics. Um, what you should see there is uh, an animation showing a technique for detecting and characterizing planets called the Doppler technique. And this technique relies on the fact that as a planet orbits around the star, the star orbits around the common center of mass of those two bodies. And the star's orbit is a scaled down and reflected version of the planet's orbit. You can see that at any point in the orbit, the star is sort of in the opposite point of its orbit. So our goal is to measure the characteristics of the star's orbit, scale it up and flip it, and we can determine the size of the planet and the size and uh, shape of its orbit. So we do this with the Doppler technique. We measure the spectrum of a star at very high resolution. And as the star is coming towards us in its orbit, the light from that star is blue shifted ever so slightly. Just as a train coming towards you, the whistle of that train goes up to a higher pitch. The same thing happens for light waves as they approach uh, the viewer. Similarly, as the planet recedes, the light is red shifted. It's shifted slightly to the red. And so with our telescopes, we can very precisely measure these so-called Doppler shifts or radial velocities, and we can deduce all sorts of details about the planet's mass and its orbit. So most of the Doppler planet hunting that I have done has been at a, a really special place. It is, this is Mauna Kea, uh, the biggest island in the, uh, sorry, the biggest mountain um, on the island of Hawaii. The scale of Mauna Kea is really immense. Um, the picture that I'm showing here is, was taken by an astronaut from the International Space Station, and it spans something like 10 or, or 20 miles on the, the side of this photograph. If you, you look towards the summit of this, uh, of this volcano, you can see that it's, it's scarred with the pockmarks of the end of its volcanism. It's a currently inactive volcano. We think it will remain inactive for a long time. And if we zoom in on the summit of this volcano, you see that it's ringed with a bunch of these white dots. Each, of the, each one of those white dots is a world-class observatory that has one of the world's largest telescopes in it. These are our eyes to the heavens. And two of my favorite telescopes on Mauna Kea are the Keck telescopes, shown here uh, from a view a little bit down the mountain. This is actually where we hope that the 30-meter telescope will be installed. And you can see the two twin Keck telescopes shining their lasers off into the galactic center, doing, uh, studying the, the supermassive black hole there and the star formation regions around it. So the Keck telescopes are really remarkable. Here's a closer view still. These are the world's largest optical telescopes. The size of the mirrors that are inside there are about 10 meters across. That's bigger than the diameter of this stage. I once lived in an apartment that had a square footage which was smaller than the square footage of the Keck telescope <laughs> mirrors. Not joking. Um, to use these telescopes, we don't actually go to the summit of Mauna Kea anymore. We go to so-called remote observing rooms. Here's one of the remote observing rooms. This is a, a sort of professional photograph uh, of one of them. This is my colleague Peter Van Dokum at Yale University. Yale is also a partner uh, in Keck Observatory. And so we're able to, using a, a sort of wall of computer screens and video conferencing with people in Hawaii, we can control the instrument and talk to the uh, telescope operator who is on the summit and is actually driving the telescope. So I want to show you another picture of a remote observing room. This is a little bit more of a casual look. So this, <laughs> this picture was taken on Christmas Eve of 2016. And we, these are my two kids who are in the audience, and as well as my niece and nephew. And we were thinking, what is the best way to try to find Santa and his reindeer? <laughs> well. Of course, if dad has access to the world's biggest telescope, then you know, what, what are you going to do? So what, what the kids didn't know is that there's a screen on this display. It's actually in this view. It's that blue box. 
And when we're on sky, it's the live view of what you can see with the telescope at any one time. And so I changed the color scale so when stars normally appear white, that I changed it so they appear red. And I did this because as we were slewing between one target to the next, the telescope is sort of zooming across the sky. And sometimes when it does this, it passes over a bright star that makes sort of a streak across the screen. And as this was happening, my, my daughter leaned over to me and said very seriously, Daddy, I think I just saw Rudolph. <laughs> so anyway, um, we don't, I, don't, I don't always have my family observing with me, uh, but it's, a fun, it's fun when I do. Um, back to the story of the measurements that we make to discover other planets. Let me show you a little, in a little bit more detail how it works. So when we go to the Keck telescope on any given night, we go through a, a list of stars and we go to each one of them and we measure its Doppler shift at that particular instant. And each one of those measurements for each star contributes a point on a graph like the one that you see up there. And it says that this is the velocity of the star at that moment in time. If we come back sometime later and we measure another velocity, we can see that the star has accelerated. It has changed its velocity during the intervening time. This is a hint that there's a planetary motion around it. And so if we come back to the same star days, weeks, months, years, decades later, we can trace out the motion of the star and therefore infer the properties of the planet which is orbiting it. So this is what that process looks like. Now I've chosen an example here. These are, these are synthetic data. These aren't in fact real data from the Keck telescope. We'll, we'll get to those in a moment. Um, this is an example of what Jupiter would look like in our own solar system. And you can read off of the graph that the time that it takes a signal to come back to the same place where it was before, that's the orbital period of the planet. It's how long it takes the planet to, to do one orbit. In the case of Jupiter, that's 12 years. You can also read off of the plot, the amplitude of this signal tells you the mass of the planet. It's actually the combination of the, the period and the amplitude. So I can tell you that this simulated signal, it corresponds to a Jupiter mass planet. If the planet was half as massive, we would see half uh, a signal half that size. So using this technique, my colleagues um, at Keck Observatory, as well as other observatories around the world, have been wildly successful in discovering planets this way. We found hundreds of planets orbiting nearby stars. The planets have properties that span the solar system and beyond in terms of their orbital periods and their masses. Some of them are Jupiter analogs. Some of them are super-Earths, a few times the mass of the Earth, orbiting in few-day orbits. So one of the ways that we can characterize this diversity of planets is if we make a plot of the, the planets by some of their key characteristics. And I'm gonna show here an artist's imagined view, or I should say inspired view, of what these planets would look like. This is based on the planet's temperatures, which are on the horizontal axis, the hot planets are on the right, as well as the planet's densities, which are on the vertical axis. Now I should say we have zero pictures of the surfaces of planets outside the solar system. So these are inspired views, but I think that they're, that's, it's inspired in the positive sense of the word. So you can see that as this animation scrolls up, we know of planets spanning a wide range of parameters, and we especially know of many small planets, especially a lot of high density, hot temperature small planets. So one view of the, uh, of the planet Zoo is that there's a tremendous diversity. We also try to find patterns in this diversity. And one of the first patterns that, um, that emerged um, is shown by this, uh, this plot here. And what we found, this is based on work by my group in about 2010, is that if you conduct a census of planets orbiting the nearest stars, as you go around to all the near stars, nearby stars and you systematically keep making measurement after measurement after measurement, and you try to detect the planets that are orbiting those stars, and you set upper limits on the planets that you would have detected but don't see, what we find is that for close-in orbits, Saturn's and Jupiter's are incredibly rare. They're sort of a few percent effect. Most stars do not have a giant planet orbiting within a few tenths of the Earth's sun distance. But as you go to smaller and smaller planets, they get more and more common. The Neptune-sized planets have an occurrence of something like 6.5%. The next bin over are the super-Earths that have an even higher occurrence. And when we did this, um, this experiment, we weren't actually sensitive to planets in this Earth-sized bin, but we couldn't resist the temptation to make 
an educated guess by extrapolating the trend that we saw. And this trend suggested a very large occurrence of planets that are the mass of the Earth. Now, when we were making this uh, diagram, we went through an interesting process with a graphic designer that I want to tell you about a little bit about because I think it highlights some of the communication challenges that we have with this science. When we were describing to this talented graphic artist named Tim Pyle um, what this histogram meant, first of all, the histogram was a much plainer, more boring version with just sort of a bar graph. And we said, oh, these are the Jupiters, these are the Saturns, these are the Neptunes. You might want to put little blue circles there. The super-Earths are the next bin over, and the Earths are the bin on the far left. And so he, Tim went away, and he came back. And the first version of his plot had super-Earths that were merely an Earth image scaled up to two or three times the size of the Earth. And we, we had to explain to Tim that we didn't, at the time we didn't actually know what super-Earths were composed of. In fact, they probably weren't Earth-like in many of their characteristics. The main reason that we used the term super-Earth and not something else is that we wanted our proposals to be funded. <laughs> uh, so, so Tim went back and, and made a new version, and after a few iterations, he came up with this, which I quite like, because it shows uh, a variety of different colors, some variety of sizes, and sort of mysteriousness, because we're still trying to figure out what these planets are made out of. Tim also had another innovation, which is that he, uh, he appropriately captured the uncertainty in our extrapolation to small planets by putting a giant question mark in the Earth mass bin. I, I really like that. OK, so that was a brief overview of our first detection technique called the Doppler technique. Let me now tell you about the second technique by which we find planets. This is the so-called transit technique. And it was made popular uh, by the Kepler Space Telescope. So Kepler is uh, a one meter telescope, which is in an Earth trailing orbit. It's been orbiting the sun for about uh, nine years now. And during the first four years of the Kepler mission, the telescope stared at this one patch of sky near Cygnus and observed 150,000 stars. Every 30 minutes, nearly without blinking, the Kepler telescope would say, how bright is that star, and that one, and that one, and that one, counting up to 150,000. And with these incredible set of brightness measurements of stars, we could hunt for uh, so-called transits of extrasolar planets. Transits occur when the orbital geometry is just right, and a planet passes in front of the star as seen from the, the line of sight of the Kepler Space Telescope. You have to be really lucky that the orbit has to be just aligned, and you also have to be in the right orbital phase of the planet, so it, it has to be uh, in the part, part of the orbit where the planet is passing in front of the star. So let me represent that with some synthetic data. This is. Uh, an imagined view of what the Kepler Space Telescope would see. So for one of those 150,000 stars, the Kepler Telescope would start off making some measurements of its brightness, and it would establish a baseline level of brightness. Over the next few half-hour intervals, it would gather a few more data points, and the brightness of the star remains constant. And over the next few days, the Kepler Space Telescope would continue to measure the brightness, and what we would see are these periodic dips in brightness. The dips, of course, are due to the planet passing in front of the star, blocking out some of the starlight. And we, from the details of these dips, if we zoom in on these two here, we can learn an incredible amount about the, the properties of the planets, uh, their orbits, and their radii. And so in particular, just as it was with the Doppler signal, the time that it takes a signal to repeat is the orbital period of the planet. It simply just has to go once around the star, and we see the same signal all over again. Here, the depth of the planet does not correspond to the mass. It corresponds to how much light is blocked. And it turns out that's related to the radius of the planet. So we're getting complementary information from these two techniques. The, on the one hand, the transits tell us about the radii of planets. That's what's shown on the vertical axis. Whereas the Doppler technique tells us about the mass, how many atoms are in a given planet. And these two complementary um, measurements, although they're coarse, they tell us an enormous amount about a population of planets. So what you can see is in the upper right, we have a population of giant planets. These are planets which are kin of Saturn and Jupiter. Some of them, in, in fact, are much larger than Jupiter. The reason for this is that they they're orbit very close to their host stars. Some of that a lot of that stellar radiation bakes the planet, and some of the, that radiation gets into the interior, 
puffs up the planet uh, into the sizes that are, in some cases, twice as large as Jupiter. If we follow the locus of points from the upper right down to the lower left, we can see that there's sort of a band of allowable masses and radii. That band goes through the, the green diamonds, which are the solar system planets. So there are, are cousins of Uranus and Neptune. And this band of points also goes down through several uh, composition contours. These are the blue lines. So whereas the, the giant planets, like Saturn and Jupiter, are primarily made of hydrogen and helium, we think that the smaller planets are primarily um, the smallest planets indeed are primarily composed of heavy materials like rock and iron. And we have examples of planets that we think are composed almost entirely of rock and iron. So having armed you with uh, uh, planet hunter status, let's uh, review, I'd like to tell you about some of the highlights of planet hunting in the last uh, few years. And I'm gonna uh, go through three of my favorite planetary systems. So the first one of these planetary systems is called TRAPPIST-1. So TRAPPIST is uh, a, an instrument that was constructed by a set of Belgian astronomers. And the, these Belgians made a, a ground-based observatory that looked specifically for transits around stars uh, that were so-called ultra-cool dwarfs. These are the coolest and smallest stars, really dim light bulbs out in interstellar space. So they named it Trappist in honor of the Trappist monks, because they're Belgian, of course. The Trappist, uh, the Trappist monks are um, a Catholic sect that uh, has many characteristics. My favorite characteristic is that they make really great um, imbibable beverages. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm often asked what my, what my favorite planet is. And I can say without reservation that it's the Chimay Grand Reserve, third from the right. <laughs> the, the Trappist. Um, data that was produced by this instrument is really quite remarkable. So what I'm showing is real data to, taken with a TRAPPIST instrument and also with a telescope from space. And you can see that most of the data points have this sort of constant value near 1.0. These are the times when there are no planets transiting. But you see lots of episodes where the points dip down below that constant level. These are episodes when one or more of the planets are transiting. The TRAPPIST-1 system is, is really remarkable because it has a total of seven planets transiting, all with orbits very close to their host star. So as, as you go down this plot, you can see that the first planet, uh, 1b, has an orbital period of something like one and a half days. There's lots of transits of it. That's the, uh, the top curve. And as we go down through b, c, d, e, f, g, and h, the orbital periods get longer and there are fewer and fewer transits during this about three week segment of data. Another way to, to look at the same data that I think is beautiful is to stack all of the transits on top of each other. This is called making a so-called uh, a phase folded light curve. So all of the transits of B are now stacked on each other and you can see that it's, it's a perfectly regular clock-like uh, aspect to this orbit. And as we go down the sequence of planet B, C, D, all the way through H, the orbital periods get longer, and the transit duration also increases. That is, the, the width in time is getting larger. This, of course, makes sense. The planets are transiting the same star, but the planets farther away from the, uh, their star have a slower orbital speed, so it takes less, I'm sorry, it takes more time for them to cross the same stellar disk. There were some um, oddities in the, in the case of TRAPPIST-1. Here's an example of a triple transit of uh, three planets crossing in front of the star at the same time. They arrived at slightly different times and they have slightly different depths. And that explains why there's a sort of very unusual staircase look to it. But it turns out data like this are invaluable to try to figure out the exact um, period and phase, the clock-like nature of these planets. So here's, an, here's what we think the um, TRAPPIST-1 system looks like, an, an artist's animation. These seven planets orbit um, well inside of what would be uh, Mercury's orbit within our own solar system. This is now showing the cover of Nature uh, about a year and a half or two ago um, that announced the discovery of these planets. The close-in planets are hot. The farther away planets are much cooler. And here we can see in real time an animation of some of these transits. 
So I'll just say tra the TRAPPIST-1 system is one of the most compelling ones for me. All right, what else is compelling in exoplanet land? Um, we've now seen <laughs> planets which, uh, multiple planets orbiting the same star. How about multiple planets orbiting more than one star? Are there any Tatooines out there? Or are they confined to a galaxy far, far away? <laughs> in fact, we do know of Tatooines. One of the Tatooines is called Kepler-47. It is a, a planetary system that has two stars at the center. They're in a tight orbit around each other. The brighter, whitish colored star in this animation is very similar to our sun. The redder star is a, an M dwarf with about a mass of about a third that of the sun and a luminosity, a brightness of only about 1% of the sun. The two planets that we see orbiting um, have, are basically cousins of Neptune. They're approximately <laughs> Neptune size. And for me, it's, it's, it would be a remarkable place to be for example, you can think about what sunsets would be like on uh, Kepler-47b. First of all, as the, as the stars reach the horizon, there'd be two shadows. You'd have shadows coming off in two different directions from the two stars. The color of the sunset would depend on which of the two stars set first. If the brighter sun-like star set first, you would have the faint red star on the horizon lingering, making an absolutely gorgeous red sunset. And if it was the other way around, you would have perhaps a more Earth-like sunset. So it's an exotic place, and it's an interesting uh, fuel for the imagination. All right, the next stop on our planet tour is a planet called Kepler-78b. This is a planet which is very close to my heart. Um, Kepler-78b was discovered by a guy named Roberto Sanchez Ojeda. And Roberto's a friend of mine. And in, in this, uh, it was about May of 2013, Roberto called me up and he said, Andrew, I just found this amazing planet. You've got to sit down. The planet has a size of 1.2 Earth radii. It's only 20% bigger than the Earth. And here's the crazy part. It only, uh, it takes eight hours for this planet to orbit its star. So a year on this planet is only eight hours. And so that was uh, mind-blowing. Um, I hung up the phone, Roberto and I promised that we would chat again soon, and I went out for a walk with my son Ian, and at the time Ian was about five years old, and Ian and I had a good chat about what it would be like to live on Kepler-78b, and I explained to Ian that, um, yes, it's Earth size, um, but there's some complications. Uh, among them are, it, it's a hundred times closer to its star than the Earth is to the sun, so the temperature on the surface of this planet is probably 2,000 or 2,500 degrees. This is hot enough to have a liquid magma ocean on the surface. Um, if you were standing on the surface, if you could somehow do that, and you looked up, you would see the, the star would not be a sort of small disk in the sky. It would subtend something like 90 degrees. So it really would be hard to hide from this star. So Ian and I started working through whether or not this would be a good place to live, and we talked about how Every eight hours it goes around its star, that's three times every Earth day, something like a thousand times every year. And Ian thought about it for a while and he said, you know, I think I might like to live there because I would have already had 5,000 birthdays. <laughs> so so I, I, I conceded his excellent point. Um, and I called Roberto back and I said, okay, Roberto, here's the interesting thing. This planet is Earth size. It's definitely not Earth temperature, but let's see if it's made of the same stuff as the Earth. So in order to do that, we already had the radius. All we needed was the mass, and we could compute a bulk density. So we went to the Keck telescope to try to measure the mass of this planet. And as the sun set over Mauna Kea, we prepared to observe. The timing was fortuitous because a night on Mauna Kea in the summer lasts about 10 hours, which is just long enough to resolve a complete orbit of this planet around its star. So we sat on the star the whole night measuring the velocity over and over and over again, a process that usually takes days, weeks, or months for other planets we could complete in a single night at the Keck Observatory. And so we, we did this at, the, at Keck, and you can see our measurements are shown in the little box labeled one. That was our first night. You can see that it took us 
something like three weeks to work up our courage to do it again. We weren't sure if we were seeing the real thing. But we did the same thing on seven more nights. So we have eight nights of staring at this one star, watching a planet go around it. Now there's some other complicated features in the data here. The red line is jiggling up and down. And turns out that's due to star spots. Um, these are cool regions analogous to the sunspots on our own sun. And they're kind of an, uh, a nuisance, but we were able to model them out to get rid of them. And so what's remarkable is that if we do that modeling and we plot up the velocity of the star at an orbital phase of the planet, we see that the, the data from when the planet is at one orbital phase, the lower left-hand corner of that left, left panel, they're all low. This tells us that the planet was consistently pulling on its star in, in just the right way. And similarly, when the planet is at the opposite orbital phase, it's pulling in the opposite direction. So the amplitude of this motion, this tug from one side to the other, tells us the mass of the planet. And when you do the math and you figure it all out, what we determine is that Kepler-78b, with its radius of 1.2 Earth radii, has a mass of 1.8 Earth radii. And for those of you who are quick to compute density in your head, we'll know that the combination of those two numbers gives us a density which is almost exactly the same density as the Earth. And so if we put this planet on the mass radius diagram, we see that, first of all, it lies very close to the Earth, and its proximity is in both mass and radius. So we think that it's made of the same material as the Earth, probably two-thirds rock and one-third iron. Here's another view of Kepler-78b. So one last little animation about Kepler-78b. This shows, this is a NASA view of what it would be like um, to sort of fly through the Kepler 78 system. Um, one problem with Kepler 78b is that it's tidally locked to its host star. It's so close that just like the moon only shows a single face to, to the Earth, Kepler 78b will also have one side facing the star at all times. This hot side then gets a magma ocean that probably boils and bubbles and gurgles and uh, ejects rock up into the atmosphere. That rock evaporates because it's so hot. And so there's literally a silicate atmosphere on the front side of this planet. We think from simulations that the silicate atmosphere will naturally be driven around to the backside of the planet where it will cool. And when you have a precipitable um, uh, uh, substance that cools in an atmosphere, it will precipitate out. So literally on the backside of this planet, as if life wasn't hard enough, it probably rains rocks. <laughs> Okay, Kepler-78b uh, is sort of a hellish world. Let's now take stock of the kind of more typical planets in the hall of planets that have been discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope. So what's shown on the screen are the, all, most of the planets discovered by Kepler, and the two axes of this plot are orbital period on the horizontal axis, uh, which is a proxy for how far away the planet is from its star, and size on the vertical axis. You can see Earth, Neptune, uh, and Jupiter drawn in there for scale. And what you can see is that a typical planet discovered by Kepler has an orbital period of a few days to a few weeks, sometimes a few months. And the typical sizes are one to four Earth radii, so basically between that of Earth and Neptune. Now, if there had been more big planets, cousins of Jupiter and Saturn, we would have easily seen them. So the fact that we see relatively few of them compared to the smaller planets means that they're not there. On the other hand, this dearth of planets in the bottom part of this graph is hard to interpret if it's real or not, because Kepler has a very hard time seeing these very shallow transits from very small worlds. So if we select a sort of uh, 30 or so planets from this distribution that are the most favorable for follow-up observations, this is what uh, members of my group did something like five or six years ago. And we follow up those Kepler-discovered planets at the Keck Observatory and measure their masses. What we find is that we're able to measure the density distribution of these planets. We're able to start to say something about the compositions of these planets. So for each one of these planets, we have a radius measurement from Kepler. That's the horizontal axis. The density, of course, comes from the combination of radius and mass. And what we see is that on the right-hand side, all of the Neptune-sized planets have Neptune-like densities. 
For some reason, nature does not make Neptune-sized rocks. Before, before Kepler, we didn't know that that was true. It could have been possible that there would be enough solid material in the disk so that nature could do that, but we see zero Neptune-sized rocks. If we go to the other side of the distribution, here's where the Earth is for reference. The solar system planets are shown by the blue diamonds. Venus is right next to it. One of the other planets that's right next to it is Kepler-78b, and now you can see that it's really a cousin, if not in temperature, but at least in mass, uh, radius, and density. And we, in addition to these sort of anchor points, we see some unusual points in this distribution. A new class of planets has emerged, which has the, a name which I really like, called the superpuffs. So superpuffs are planets that are a little bit bigger than the Earth, sometimes about one and a half to two times the radius of the Earth, and they have low densities. The low densities mean that they probably have rocky cores, but then on top of that rocky core is a voluminous hydrogen-helium atmosphere that lowers the overall bulk density by increasing the size of the planet. In addition to super-Earths, we have a new class of planets, the sub-Neptunes, that are sort of intermediate uh, between uh, Earth and Neptune. It's an open question whether or not sub-Neptunes actually are scaled-down Neptunes. My own view is that they're probably not. Neptune is characterized by having a lot of astrophysical ices like water and methane. We think that these inner planets probably didn't have such a large fraction of those materials. We also see some oddballs that I don't quite know what name to put to them. These are planets that have a radius of about twice that of Earth and high densities. I think some of these planets are probably going to go away in the sense that their measurements are not, the, the mass measurements are not perfect, and with more measurements they're going to come down. But some of them I think will stay, and these may be the biggest rocks made in the planet formation process, about twice the size of the Earth. So an overall characteristic of this distribution is that we see this transition from gas-dominated planets on the, the right to rocky planets on the left. We see a similar distribution when we look in detail at the planet sizes. So the initial studies from Kepler um, told us that small planets are common. This is the complement of what we learned from the Doppler surveys, that uh, small mass planets are common. And in a study by my group, uh, led by B.J. Fulton, we measured very precisely the sizes of the host stars. Now, why do we care about the stars? The planets are the things we're really after. Well, you'll remember that when I showed the, the plot of, uh, of the transit depth, what we're actually measuring is the size of the planet relative to the size of the star, because you could scale up or down the whole uh, planet and star system. And if the planet is twice as big and the star is twice as big, the transits look exactly the same. So we need to precisely measure the stars to precisely measure the planets. With this survey, we did that, and we were able to split this distribution of planet radii into two groups, and we now identify them as the super-Earths, which we think are the higher density objects, and the sub-Neptunes, which are the lower density objects. So I think of this, this split in the family tree of planets as sort of analogous to how Linnaeus might have felt when he was discovering splits in the, the tree of life. The tree of life, of course, has far more branches than, than the tree of planets. We're, we're, we're stuck with just a few branches so far, but I feel like we're, on a good, we're off to a good start. And so as we were working on this project, we worked with Tim Pyle again to make a, a, a graphic to represent this, and we came up with a tree of planets. And what we think is that all planets descend from a protoplanetary disk. These are the birthplaces of planets. This is where the rocky material comes together to form a core. And if a, an atmosphere exists, it accretes onto the planet from that protoplanetary disk. So uh, the conditions have to be just right so that enough material comes together quickly enough so the planets can swell in mass and radius and become giant planets. That's one formation pathway that leads off to the right. In the small planet branch, we've now discovered this bifurcation between the super-Earths and the mini-Neptunes, two different planet types that underwent, uh, we think underwent different uh, formation processes, or at least responded to their formation environment a little bit differently. So let me take you briefly through what we think is that birth and formation story. So among the small planets, we think that all of these small planets form in protoplanetary disks initially by 
assembling of small grains, literally dust grains that grow by accretion and become bigger and bigger, eventually becoming kilometer-sized objects. Those kilometer-sized objects coalesce and become objects the size of Moon, the Mars, uh, Mars, the Earth, and even bigger. These rocky cores then are big enough to pull in gas from the surrounding nebula and start to accrete atmospheres. And we think that this process happens so that depending on the conditions, some planets are endowed with thick atmospheres, some planets are endowed with rather thin atmospheres, and that there's a distribution, a natural range of atmosphere sizes. Now, the way that we get a sort of a sharp division between these two planets happens in the next step. And that next step is when you bake the planets. What happens is with these young stars is that they're, they, they output a lot of very high energy radiation, uh, ultraviolet light, x-rays. Um, the star, early lives of stars are really quite um, violent. And so this baking process is able to remove thin atmospheres, but if there's not enough energy to remove the thickest atmospheres. It's a runaway process, so there's a certain atmosphere size that's just big enough so that it will stay, and all atmospheres smaller than that are basically blown off of their star. Now, by the way, I would, although I said earlier that our Earth's atmosphere is an essential characteristic of the Earth, I would actually say that the Earth has no atmosphere on this sort of crude level. The atmosphere of the Earth is just paper thin, and it's a mass of about one one millionth the mass of the Earth. So here, when we talk about an atmosphere, we're actually talking about a thick envelope that's, uh, that's contributes substantially to the size of the planet. Anyway, this is the story of how we think super-Earths and mini-Neptunes are born. Okay, so we've now talked about the diversity of planets. We've talked about some of my favorite uh, planets from the zoo. Let's come back to the subject of Earth-like planets. And in particular, let's come back to one of the characteristics of uh, planets that I think makes them especially Earth-like, and that characteristic is that they have the right temperature. There's a concept in this field called the habitable zone. The habitable zone is a set of orbits of a planet where it's just the right distance from the star. It's, if the planet had orbited closer to the star, any liquid water that happened to be on the surface would have been boiled off and lost to space. These planets are too hot. And uh, likewise, planets that orbit farther away from their stars are too cold, and that water would be locked up in ice. So note that the concept of the habitable zone doesn't say that the planets orbiting there necessarily have water and are habitable. It merely says that it's the right place so that if a planet has those other characteristics, it would be possibly habitable. OK, have we discovered any planets like this? You probably know from reading the news that the answer is yes. The Kepler Space Telescope has discovered a number of planets that are the right same size and temperature as the Earth. Here's an example of one. This system is called Kepler-138. I'm sorry, Kepler-186. Um, Kepler-186 has uh, four planets in the inner part of the solar system, and then a fifth planet, F, which is nearly Earth's size and orbits in this green band, which is the habitable zone. So you'll notice that this drawing is to scale, and the habitable zone of Kepler-186 is closer in than the habitable zone in our own solar system. The reason for this, of course, is that Kepler-186 is a much dimmer star. It puts out less light and heat. And so just as the embers of the campfire start to go out, you have to huddle close to the campfire to stay warm. The habitable orbits around these, these uh, dim stars are in closer orbits. This is the case of Kepler-186. So we want to, this is a great example of a, a habitable zone planet. Let's try to do the statistics of them. I'm showing again the distribution of planets that were discovered by Kepler. And you'll see that it, Kepler is kind of just barely getting planets that have the size of the Earth, one Earth radius, and an orbital period of 365 days, similar to our own Earth. So we want to do the statistics and ask the question, how common are planets in the, in the right-hand side of that diagram? To do this, uh, I worked with a talented student named Eric Pettigura, who developed some code, computer code, to specifically look for planets of this type and actually find planets of all types. And Eric's code that was called Terra looks for these telltale small dips of warm Earth-size planets. This is a schematic of what the, the search entailed. We look for these small dimmings separated by a year or, or 
give or take. And the code was able to um, also statistically account for two important ways that we could miss planets. So you could imagine that for every planet that has just the right geometry so that it passes uh, between the star and our line of sight, there will be many planets that are, have their orbits tilted slightly out of view. And so we have to statistically account for those planets if we're going to estimate the true occurrence of planets. And it turns out that's a relatively easy thing to do because the, the orbits of the planets are randomly distributed in all orbital planes. The second way that we have to account for this is to uh, account for the fact that some of the stars are just noisier than others. They're, they have stellar atmospheres that are bubbling and boiling and producing variations in brightness that mask the signals of these small transiting planets. So we have to statistically account for that as well. Here are the planets that were discovered by Eric's pipeline. This is nearly identical to the, the planets discovered by the official Kepler pipeline. And Eric was able to do so-called injection and recovery tests to figure out the sensitivity of his pipeline and take the number of planets which are detected in the green box. These are the planets which we think are in the habitable zone, the set of orbits that are consistent with liquid water, and also the set of radii that are plausibly like that of Earth, one to two Earth radii. So there are, are in fact, quite um, high volume and sometimes vicious debates in the literature about the precise boundaries of this green box, the habitable zone. I don't want to get into the, any of those debates here. In fact, I think it's maybe foolish to, bear, to too precisely define what the habitable zone is. We can just say that there is some corner, some region of parameter space where planets are going to have the right size and temperature. And let's try to figure out approximately how many planets inhabit it. So when we do this calculation, I'll now show a little video that, uh, that captures our main result from this. And I'll, I'll re-narrate some of what I've already described. So in our search, Eric, uh, that was led by Eric Pettigura, we, we search for transits of Earth-sized Earth temperature planets orbiting 40,000 of the best stars in the Kepler field. And we look specifically for habitable zone orbits, not too hot, not too cold. We focused on planets that were about one to two times the size of the Earth. And when we corrected for all of the statistics that I described that I don't want to go into any more details about, we found that 20% of sun-like stars have a planet that is the same size and the same temperature as the Earth, give or take. And for me, this is an absolutely remarkable number. Before the Kepler mission, we didn't know if warm Earth-sized planets were one in a million or if they were 100%. And now we know that they're about 20%. And that's, that 20% is really quite a large number. So what I'd encourage you to do is when you find the time, go out to a nice dark sky, let your eyes adapt, look up, and start counting the stars. <laughs> Every fifth star that you get to could plausibly have a planet that's the same size and temperature as the Earth. And when you get to a dark site where the stars absolutely fill the sky, you'll get a sense for how pervasive these Earth-size, Earth-temperature planets are. It's going to be remarkable. OK, so we've now I've told you about some of the diversity of planets. We've learned that planets are abundant. We've learned that planets the size of the Earth, even the temperature of the Earth, have been detected. We've, we also know that some planets which are the same size and mass of the Earth have been detected. So how do we make progress? Where do we go from here? Um, I'd like to emphasize two paths forward. Um, I think one of the paths forward is that we're, we need to be astrophysicists who continue to keep studying the diversity of planets. We need to understand how these planets formed, how they evolved, what the building blocks for the planets are, what are the limiting and leading physical processes in their evolution. This is going to give us a backdrop to understanding the planet formation history that was, is, I think is both astrophysically interesting and is also necessary to understand some of the more life-oriented questions. The second thing that I think we need to do is we need to look more for planets that have Earth-like characteristics. How many more combinations of Earth size, temperature, mass, atmosphere can we find? These will be some of the planets that we want to go after in the coming years and decades. So I think an important lesson for me also is that we have been repeatedly humbled by the Copernican experience of learning that our Earth is not special, that we do not occupy a central position in the solar system, a central position 
in the galaxy, we've now learned that the Earth is not even a particularly unusual combination of size and temperature. So if I was forced to bet, I would bet that planets that have many of the conditions, like our Earth, exist in the Milky Way galaxy. But fortunately, we're not forced to bet. We don't have to have faith. We can do the experiment. We can build instruments to actually go and look for these planets, and we can try to answer this question for ourselves. So in the remaining time, I'd like to focus on one particular instrument that, I, that will be developed in the next couple of years and which will be, I think, play an important part of our search for these small planets. So this instrument is called the Keck Planet Finder. It's being developed by my group uh, here at Caltech and also at UC Berkeley. And the Keck Planet Finder is a Doppler uh, measuring device that is far more precise and also far more efficient than our existing instrument that's been so successful at Keck Observatory. That other instrument is called HiRes. Now, the KPF overcomes one of the main limitations of these measurements, which is that effectively what we're doing is when we measure the displacement of the spectrum, the Doppler shift of the spectrum, that's literally the spectrum moving ever so slightly to the left or to the right on the detector. And so we have to be absolutely sure that that shift is not due to some local perturbation, that nobody's kicking the side of the instrument, that there's no temperature variation that causes it to, to swell or, uh, or to shrink in just the right way that would mimic it. So one of the tricks up our sleeve is that we're, we're building this instrument out of a special kind of glass called Zerodur. So everything that's tan on this diagram is this special exotic material that's nearly impervious to temperature perturbation. So if you change its temperature, it will not change its length down to the nanometer level. So as I said, KPF is going to be a great planet hunting and characterizing machine. It's going to, we're going to do both astrophysics and perhaps even astrobiology. We're going to study the super-Earths and the sub-Neptunes. We're going to go after those uh, Earth size, Earth temperature planets from Kepler, and we're going to try to measure their masses. Uh, but I want to focus in my last couple slides on a particular application that I think will be noteworthy. And that application is looking for planets uh, the same mass and temperature of the Earth around the nearest cool stars. So what I'm showing here is a signal of a Jupiter mass planet orbiting a nearby M dwarf. And I've chosen an orbit that's 14 days. Why 14 days? That happens to be in the, in the habitable zone of one of these M dwarfs that's faint, and so the, the habitable zone orbits are close in. So Jupiter is easy to detect. This is simulated data from high res. This is what we would see. And we have another way of quantifying the significance of the signal for the the nerds in the audience were effectively doing a Fourier transform on the data. We're computing a periodogram to tell how strong that signal is. So when there's a, a spike, that tells us that the signal is robust. So putting that all together, we can see that Jupiter is easily detected with high res. And now what I want to do is dial down the mass of the planet and see when we start to lose our detectability. So if we do that, first we make it Saturn mass, still easily detectable, Neptune mass, still pretty easily detectable with high res. Super Earth mass, 10 Earth masses, it's getting a little dicey. Uh, in fact, sorry, here's the super Earth. This is five times the mass of the Earth. It's getting a little dicey, but I think I would believe that. If we dial it down further to two Earth masses and the mass of the Earth, we've lost the signal. So if you want to find planets with the mass and temperature of the Earth around the nearest stars, you just can't do it with high res. If we play the same game with this new instrument, KPF, and we dial down the mass, Jupiter, of course, is easy, Saturn's easy, Neptune, sub-Neptune, super-Earth is still pretty easy. Uh, twice the size of the Earth we can detect, and even Earth mass planets we can detect. So I think this will be quite a feat when we can start getting the names and addresses of the nearest stars that have these Earth mass, Earth temperature planets. Why is this important? One reason is that while we've learned about the statistics of these planets from the Kepler mission, Kepler observed almost entirely in one fixed direction of space out in a, a cone into the sky. And so all of the planets from the Kepler mission are in this cone, and most of the interesting planets are really far away, far too distant to measure with our powerful upcoming telescopes to do follow-up measurements. If we survey the nearest stars, these are right next door, and it opens uh, the possibility of doing follow-up measurements, like building specialized instruments for Keck Observatory to directly image these planets, to separate planet light from starlight, 
and to see the faint glow of planets orbiting nearby stars. That, that faint glow can be separated. We can make a picture of the planet. We can also take a spectrum of these planets, and we can start to learn something about their atmospheres to figure out if they're at all like the Earth or if indeed they're quite different. So I'm excited to undertake these things and to find out. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.